Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Connecting Struggles to Address Corporate Abuse, Women's Stories of Resistance Across Regions and the Binding Treaty on Enterprises and Human Rights. We are very uh, excited for this conversation. Uh, this is the second of a series of webinars we will be doing in the aim of advancing together a feminist vision of a world of work. Uh, greetings from EZRNet. I am Viviana Osorio and I will be facilitating today's conversation. Um, we are giving a couple of more minutes for um, two of the speakers to get online. Uh, for one of the speakers to get online. In the meanwhile, um, I would like to explain that you should choose your language uh, here below. <laughs> um, we will be having interventions today in English and Spanish, so please make sure that you um, choose your language so you can listen to um, so you can listen to the to the to the language you speak. Okay. So um Okay, I think that we could start now. Um thank you very much for joining us today again. Um in this webinar, we uh, wanted to create an opportunity to understand and to address the ways in which corporate activities perpetuate widespread discrimination against women in workplaces, contribute to precarious working conditions, and give rise to gender-specific and disproportionate human rights and environmental abuses. Uh, this discussion is aiming to connect the struggles of women trade unionists and those in the struggles for land and natural resources to put under the spotlight how corporate abuse directly impact the rights of women and their communities. Uh, participants will also address the forthcoming UN binding treaty on business and human rights for granting the leadership and lived experiences of women as an integral to the creation of robust human rights-based standards and mechanisms that will advance substantive equality. Uh, this webinar has been uh, developed and planned together with the Corporate Accountability Working Group. So we will, be, we will have today uh, five amazing uh, speakers. Um, and I will uh, be. I will introduce them at the moment of their presentation. Um, each of them will have up to uh, eight minutes each, and I will write in the chat when you have um, uh, one minute left, so you can wrap up your your presentation. Um, our hope is to have a space for questions after all the presentations, so please take note of your questions. Uh, you will have the opportunity to write those questions in the chat, and hopefully the speakers will be able to respond to, the, to your questions at the end of their interventions. Um, so to start, I would like to invite I would like to invite uh, Mewish uh, Lagari. Uh, Mewish um, is part of the Fisher Folk People. She is representing the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, and she's also a very strong young women leader from the World Forum of Fisher Peoples. Um, Pakistan Fisher Folk uh, Forum uh, aims to protect the socioeconomic and political rights of indigenous fisher folk communities in Pakistan by, bring, by bringing sustainability in the usage of water resources. So with, um, so Mawish, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation today. Uh, I would like to uh, invite you to share with us um, how are corporate abuses manifesting in communities and what impacts are women and their communities confronting? So I will leave you the floor now. You're giving me opportunity to speak. Uh, the corporate capture, 
corporate is a uh, uh, is a technique to manipulate the communities and uh, uh, corporate always uh, target the vulnerable community vulnerable people to to uh, to uh, to make their businesses uh, so fishing community is already vulnerable and they are already deprived from the fundamental right so uh, uh, corporate targeted that community and uh, and grab their land and install lot of the power plant factories and uh, and they took their land and and, and make big uh, uh, big factories big uh, power plants and uh, coal uh, importing coal from the other countries and that corporate just uh, 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 taking the people uh, fishing communities thari communities on the daily wages and they are giving the uh, uh, little amount on the daily wages and uh, and saying that you are not educated so you are not uh, we are not giving you the that much uh, sophisticated job or you are just working on the daily wages and they are giving the job uh, also to the women and uh, we, they are not allowing them to give them maternity leaves uh, medical leaves or uh, or they are just uh, giving them a daily wages and if a woman is not coming one or two days they just say we don't need you uh, so uh, corporate uh, corporate is just uh, we are saying them the uh, corporate grabber uh, ocean grabber because they are the capturing the land nearby the ocean islands uh, and the corporate uh, they are also uh, because uh, the uh, nearby the coastal is very easy to dump their all the waste into the sea when they are dumping the waste in uh, waste into the sea then the fishing fishing is uh, going into the deep and then their livelihood is also destroying they can't go for the fishing and it's very difficult to go for the fishing because they don't find the fish nearby the uh, uh, nearby the coast because they are small scale fishermen they are not uh, uh, big scale fishermen and also the corporate is also the uh, uh, deep sea fishing trawlers deep sea fishing trawler is the uh, is the uh, they give uh, pakistani government give the lease to the other other com, uh, countries for the deep sea fishing trawler they they uh, they lease the, uh, them and they come and they just uh, go in the deep sea and they uh, fishing in the deep sea and they also ruin the livelihood and the condition of their fishermen is very bad they are peeling the fish uh, peeling the grabs and uh, prawns uh, and they are not getting the wedges so uh, also these these thing is not also impacting on the women or community these also impacting on the environment also uh, if i uh, if i if i uh, taking the situation of the pakistan because pakistan is not the developed country is the uh, it's a developing country and uh, uh, and lot of the things is not on the uh, on the proper channel is not on the road so oh, uh, so it's uh, when the they are uh, uh, planting the power plant in the in the third so uh, 270 villages were displaced to Uh, uh, displays for the uh, coal mining and the coal power plants so no nobody is asking them that why they are doing this and because it's very easy to manipulate the vulnerable community they are said that we uh, you, you are vulnerable so we will give you education we uh, hospitals and give you all these things then they manipulate and they say okay it's it's for our uh our development so we are accepting your project but they don't know what's the be uh, what's the reason and what will be the effect uh, on their uh, health on their uh, on their livelihood now the 270 village villages were displaced and they took their water resources there uh, there is a guraro dam and now the now the situation of that people is very bad 
they are they are uh, deprived from all the rights human rights are joined there because they are not they don't have shelters they don't have uh, safe drinking water they don't have f uh, secure food and they are just uh, they uh, even they are ready to take the compensate from that and uh, now they are starting the work in block 2 in the third and uh, they just took their cultivated land and they said they just uh, said that uh, leave that places and with the families they just uh, send uh, took their land without their without giving them any notice without any uh, prior uh, notification and they uh, grabbed their land and now they are protecting uh, uh, protecting uh, for their land and all these things. So corporate is not the single actor. It's uh, uh, in Pakistan, uh, arm is also with the corporate or uh, state because the state is also corporate. So these 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 uh, 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 making a very powerful uh, powerful actors. So sometimes it is very difficult to face this uh, powerful powerful actors and how to uh, shut down these powerful uh, shut down these corporate and how to account make them accountable that they are doing this very wrong this is not good for the people for the communities and this uh, and their ancient rights they are destroying also their uh, ancient right their human rights their land rights their natural resources but they are just take uh, sake for the uh, profit and uh, women uh, in Pakistan women are the women uh, are also uh, victim of the domestic violence and she is this she is the one she is the one who is responsible for whole, whole uh, uh, for whole home and and then when she is responsible for the home and then the corporate is also uh, the uh, impacting on them. So, uh, in uh, in Pakistan, women are more vulnerable as compared to men. Men is also impacting on that uh, corporate, but women is women especially fisher for communities because they are targeting the coastal belt and uh, taking all the land nearby the coastal because it's very easy to import, export, and, uh, and uh, wasting their, uh, their corporate uh, waste into the sea. So uh, for, 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 for me, uh, I want to make them accountable. I, 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 my, my advocacy, my campaign, so I want to make my uh, struggle strong to make them accountable that they are doing wrong even even my state too because state is not ready to listen no uh, not re uh, doing anything against these powerful actors arm act, uh, arm is also with uh, with this cor uh, involved in this corporation so uh, in my in my in my uh, my recommendation is that this treaty or uh, is very very good to advocate for uh, to make them accountable and um, uh, it's, it, we need a strong movement strong struggle to stop this corporation uh, stop this corporate abuse and also the human right they are uh, uh, this corporate is also abusing human right as well environment Thank you very much, Mawish, for sharing your experiences from the fisher folks communities uh, in Pakistan. Now, I would like to leave the floor to Shansita Mark. She's part of the United Sisterhood Alliance. This is an alliance integrated by four social groups in Cambodia. They work with rural women, marginalized women who are also part of a value chain. So, um, Shansita, thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to um, to ask you where 
along value chains, violations and exploitation of women occur, and uh, therefore how women workers in different countries can work together to confront systemic sources of abuse in different industries. What are those connections um, that you perceive among the struggles related to women and land and those related to women and work? So I am leaving the floor to you now.
Thanks, Shansita, for a great presentation. And uh, we have heard so far how uh, states, corporations, the other investments, the flexibilization of the many uh, legal frameworks and restrictions are creating conditions for uh, dispossession and doing harm to nature without being held uh, accountable. So, um, before leaving the floor to Turibia, it seems that she's having a little troubles with her connection. I would like to welcome Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Kariuki, who is from the Kenya Human Rights uh, Commission, uh, as Mewish mentioned during her intervention. Um, there's a, a UN binding treaty being um, negotiated um, that might represent a good opportunity to, uh, to move forward in the aim of um, strengthening the responsibilities of the states and uh, corporations. So, um, Elizabeth, um, you have been very engaged in this process um, <clears throat> of discussion, in this process of negotiation at the UN to move forward this um, hopefully binding treaty uh, on enterprises and human rights. So, I would like to ask you um, why is a UN binding treaty on business and human rights important? What is it about? And what are challenges and gaps that we are facing regarding the content, approach, and the process of the UN treaty currently being negotiated? So thank you very much again for joining us today. I will leave the floor to you now. Um, thank you very much, uh, Viviana. I hope everyone can hear me because uh, I haven't had the thing for the last uh, 15 minutes or so. So I was only able to hear what the first speaker uh, spoke about, unfortunately. Um, just to get into the topic of uh, why, why the treaty, um, the, 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 thrust, the thrust of this treaty is to um, develop a, a legally binding instrument that would effectively address human rights abuses by corporations, as well as enhance accountability and mechanisms for redress for those negatively impacted. Now, um, the, the treaty covers a host of um, issues within it, uh, amongst them being um, the rights of victims, uh, legal liability, uh, mutual legal assistance, prevention, um, adjudicative jurisdiction, amongst other things. Uh, but relating uh, this treaty to um, the impact on uh, the lives of women in their communities, and particularly from what I had uh, the first speaker speak about, and uh, using the treaty to address the vulnerabilities of women, uh, we understand that uh, the structural causes of women's economic inequality and human rights violations uh, remain largely unaddressed. And corporate abuse is a key area in the struggle to overcome systemic and structural barriers to gender, social, and economic justice. But the neoliberal uh, approach or economic model that we have uh, promises growth and progress but in the same vein, it favors huge multinational corporations and concentrates wealth in the hands of a few um, of the global elite. Uh, in this context, therefore, a feminist approach becomes uh, very critical in uh, negotiating this treaty because then it would help us challenge um, this model of neoliberalism in the push for economic and gender justice. Um, so, um, just uh, having uh, taking a look at the treaty and looking at uh, probably provisions that um, that could help um, advance uh, issues that are of interest to women and girls, and particularly addressing the systemic issues that women have been suffering from, and the binding treaty has the potential to address these challenges um, that contribute to widening social inequalities and massive extraction and exploitation of natural resources through the regulation of transnational corporations and other um, business enterprises, thus ending de decades of corporate impunity and also ensuring access to justice for the communities affected. So I would first like uh, to highlight a few issues in which um, uh, gender was addressed by the draft um, that we had last year, which we call the Zero Draft. And uh, I'd like to speak about two instances. Um, if you look at Article 9 of the Zero Draft, uh, which speaks about um, prevention, it highlighted the need to carry out meaningful consultations which affect groups living 
which affect groups giving special attention to those facing heightened risk of violations. And in this instance, um, it included women amongst those people, th- those groups that um, um, suffer those kind of risks. And then Article 15 also provided that state parties shall address specific impacts of business activities while giving special attention to those facing heightened risks of violation of human rights within the context of business activities, and it says uh, such as women. The text also included a provision on business activities in conflict-affected areas and mentioned special attention to both gender-based and sexual um, uh, violence. But uh, I would like to ask to turn our attention now to the draft that we are currently discussing, which um, I'll call the July draft for lack of a better term. And uh, right from the preamble, um, uh, it recognizes the right of every person to have effective and equal access to justice and remedy. So that um, provision there of equal access to justice and remedy, of course, um, means all gender and uh, all vulnerable groups, and that thus is a good thing for, 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 for women. And then it also recognizes the distinctive and disproportionate impact certain business-related human rights abuses on women and girls, children, and indigenous people, as well as persons with disability, migrants, and refugees have. So you will find that provision um, in the preamble of the, of the July draft. And then when you look at the section on the rights of victims, I'd like uh, to uh, uh, underscore section um, article 4, uh, subsection 13, which recognizes administrative as well as other barriers of access to justice. This is critical because uh, oftentimes women have suffered this kind of um, barriers to access to justice, uh, which have hindered them from, from being able to access remedy. So this article states that state parties shall assist victims in overcoming such barriers, including through waiving costs where needed. State party shall not require victims to provide a warranty as a condition for commencing proceedings. And I think that is very uh, crucial, particularly uh, with respect to women. And then Article 4, um, Sabbatical 14, which speaks about uh, the rights of human rights defenders, again, it provides that state party shall take adequate and effective measures to recognize, protect, and promote all the rights recognized in this instrument to persons, groups, and orientations that promote and protect and defend the human rights and the environment. This is also very important because um, in our work, we all know that uh, women human rights defenders particularly face a lot of challenges, uh, given the fact that, um, you know, they already uh, suffer a lot of challenges being women, and then being in the space of uh, defending human rights exposes them to many more um, challenges and violations. So it is a good thing that that article provides us much. And then when we go to the article on um, prevention, Article 5, uh, 3B seeks to elaborate what uh, human rights due diligence is about, and particularly um, mentions uh, women and uh, situates them uh, within the process of human rights due diligence. And it says that uh, carrying out meaningful consultations with groups whose human rights can potentially be affected by the business activities and with other relevant stakeholders through appropriate procedures, including through their representative institutions, while giving special attention to those facing heightened risks. And then again, it recognizes women, children, and persons with disabilities as people that uh, particularly suffer uh, heightened risks, and therefore that human rights due diligence processes should be very sensitive to the needs of these kind of uh, groups of people. And then um, the, 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 the July draft also creates an international fund for victims, and um, this fund is supposed to provide legal and financial aid to victims, but uh, it does not uh, give a commencement date of when um, this fund should be created by. So in terms of the challenges, because I had also been um, asked um, to speak about the challenges that this process has had, um, of course, um, families have had a big problem with women being referred to as uh, vulnerable groups, as opposed to looking at uh, the systemic issues that, uh, and the structural issues that have led women to being in the positions that they have been uh, of dejection. And therefore, um, well, one of the things that um, feminists have been uh, advancing is that uh, gender issues need to be looked at very broadly, and they need not be um, looked 
act in terms of men and women because uh, that then um, loses sensitivity for LGBT persons. So the, the, the gender then needs to be very broad and it needs to look at uh, the, the, the entirety of um, the, the human race. And then the other challenge there has been has been the corporate capture of the process. Um, if you look at uh, the four sessions that you have been through, um, the, the, you can already see that um, the co corporations have a very strong hold on the process, uh, whereas uh, you know uh, there's a very huge representation of corporations. There's a very very lean uh, representation of civil society organisations, and even in the um, deliberations, uh, we do not see victim speakers on their own behalf. Uh, usually, on the last day, we have a session that they call the voices of victims. But it is we civil society organizations that speak for victims. Yet companies are represented by themselves. You know, they're not represented through agency and states are there in their own capacity. So I think um, in terms of uh, achieving balance going forward, it will be critical that we continue advancing that victims speak for themselves. Of course, we represent them. But it would be nice that they also uh, speak to, for themselves, just like um, corporations also speak for themselves, in addition to them, them being spoken by, by associations they belong to, such as the, the, the International Labour Associations um, and so on and so forth. And then um, there, there needs to be uh, an, elaboration, an elaboration on the specific measures that need to be taken to address gender-specific and identity-based risks, such as gender division of labour at the family level, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the treaty speaks about gender in a very broad sense without looking at the pe peculiarities of uh, the issues that uh, women um, uh, suffer from. And then the other challenge I would speak about is that um, um, the, the process has faced a lot of challenges, particularly with regard to um, the lack of interest um, by key developed countries and economic blocs, such as the EU, as well as the US, and also a very lackluster um, participation by African countries. Um, I would struggle to remember a time that uh, the Kenyan delegation um, attended uh, this kind of uh, negotiations from Monday till Friday throughout the whole week of the negotiations. And the same applies to so many other countries in Africa. And even when they attend, um, they have little to say in terms of uh, lending their voice to this process of negotiation. So, of course, that puts us in a, in a very weak position as um, countries that um, have suffered a lot uh, through years of uh, appropriation of resources by huge corporations. And these resources have left our countries with very little for us to show out of that appropriation. So, um, and we continue then uh, suffering the challenge of uh, lack of representation in this very noble um, exercise. So I don't know whether I have uh, overshot my time, but I'd like to stop there and uh, welcome your questions. Thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing about some of, some of the most uh, important issues uh, being discussed uh, in the process for the binding treaty um, and some of the uh, specific challenges regarding to the content uh, related to women's rights. Uh, now, I would like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Alejandra Scampini. Alejandra is part of uh, Poder. Uh, Poder, is, Poder is a project on organizing development, education, and research. And um, uh, the mission of Poder is improve corporate transparency and accountability in Latin America and to strengthen civil society and so stakeholders of corporations as long-term accountability warrantors. So, uh, Alejandra, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I would like to invite you to share with us what are those key issues particularly relevant for women so far included in the draft? What are those demands being elevated in this process uh, regarding to women's rights? And how a binding treaty might positively impact women's lives and their communities? Um, both Mawish and Sita, they were sharing about the impact of the corporate abuse uh, on women and communities, and it would be great how this particular um, forthcoming binding treaty uh, might have the potential to uh, make a difference in their own context. Um, 
So thank you very much. I will leave you the floor now. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So I wanted to start um, by sharing um, a video. I don't know if I can do that or if anyone can help me. I just put on the, on the chat also the link. Um, is it possible to share it? But I don't know how to do it. To share my screen, probably. Do you know how? Hello? Do you know how I could share my screen? Okay, it's not possible now. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, to share a little bit of the testimonies of uh, women uh, from Sonora to start my presentation. I think uh, it's important because I couldn't hear you before because of technical problems to see the links between the, what's happening in, in the territories and what is going on in the Geneva discussions. And if there is no link on that, it's not possible that the binding treaty is substantive and really responding to the needs of the people on the ground. So, uh, as you know, Poder has been for more than, for almost five years, uh, following the case of the spillover uh, of, uh, in Rio Sonora in Mexico, the dam uh, spilled over um, 400 um, liters of, uh, of cobre. Uh, I'm, I understand that I'm speaking in English. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Is that fine? El derrame del, del río Sonora. There was a spillover in the Sonora River in Mexico, and it had an impact on over 300,000 persons in the community. It took place three years ago. The communities still are seeking for justice and reparations because there were health damages, their livelihood and sustainability was also affected and they have not been able to be engaged in the solutions. And Grupo Mexico is the company that caused this spillover. And there are plenty of stories like this throughout the region. We recently heard about an advocate in Guatemala. She was an environmentalist. She was murdered because she had filed a complaint for corruption and she was gaining leadership throughout the community. She was reforesting in communities as well. I recently was part of the fourth regional consultation on human rights where over 300 representatives of communities and indigenous communities were claiming and they were calling for an open consultation process. As you will see, this is not a part of the binding treaty. I just wanted to let you know that this is the real reason why we need a binding treaty. Around these stories, we have defendants, we have advocates, we have, there's violence and there are women claiming for justice and they have not had access uh, to justice. There are, haven't been any reparations. And this is why all these stories are at the core of the discussion for a binding treaty. When feminists get uh, together around a feminist group for a binding treaty or when we unite our voices in an alliance for the treaty or when we unite our voices to dismantle corporate powers, these are the topics we engage in. Advocates, indigenous peoples, and uh, free consent, you, you know, con informed consent as well, privacy for human rights, advocates, respect for territories, for consultation, a free informed consultation, participants and engagement must be significant, access to justice, prevention, 
And of course, we also want it to be reflected throughout the entire binding treaty, and we do not just want to add women up and then let's mix them and put them together and that's about it. No. As part of this discussion, we wonder, are there human rights violations? Well, of course. And one of the challenges, as the previous speaker was saying, is that as part of international law, the concept of transnational companies does not exist. They are, they sh there's nothing that forces them to provide reparations. And there's nothing talking about the rights they are infringing, access to justice, access to natural resources, free association, mental health integrated health, the right to a decent workplace. Therefore, all of these rights need to be expressed. And who are the infringers? Who violates the human rights? Transnational companies, state-owned companies, and states. Who are the victims? Well, as some of us say, let me n not say the word victim, but who are the targets? Who are being targeted by these companies? Mostly women, if we think about the working environment, they uh, work in precary and precarious jobs. There's labor abuse, they're uh, forced shifts, and they are displaced from their territories as well sometimes. So there's a series of evidences led to these spaces. So we're not only talking about victims, we're not only talking about access to justice and reparation, but remember there's also evidence that throughout the global production chain, if we trace it, there are different moments in which human rights and all sorts of rights are violated. And we must be strong in claiming that the economic stakeholders should be disclosed because many of the companies acting in our territories have their headquarters elsewhere. This is why our challenge is to incorporate extraterritoriality and multinational companies should be held accountable, although their headquarters may not be located at the country in which they're operating. The UN binding treaty is a historical treaty. It's a one-time event because it's the first time we are finding out a way to hold transnational companies accountable. Since it's the first time, it includes new jurisdiction, new jurisprudence in Geneva, where they're not used to hearing about social, cultural, and human rights. And the other stakeholders are not necessarily the same ones we meet at a national or regional level or in New York to talk about reproductive and sexual rights or the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples or to talk about the violence in the workplace suggested by the World Labor Organization. This is why feminists are trying to educate the official delegates and our friends, our peers in activism as well, because this must be encompassed as part of women's rights. And this is also part of the corporate capture process. They have cap they have took over it of the process as well. And we must all be working together because private stakeholders are taking the seat of the true protagonists of these discussions, women. The UN just subscribed a partnership agreement with the World Economic Forum. So now we know that the private sector has an instrument to have a more direct in, say in development, and we can keep on advancing the private sector and the corporate sector that is a key of economic growth and empower citizenship. The feminist group for the binding treaty, I'm, I'm trying to look the, uh, up the version of the most recent text, throughout two months, 
we have uh, analyzed and reviewed the new draft, and we all know that when it comes to structural topics, the text does not acknowledge the causes that made it necessary and urgent to have a binding treaty that ends impunity among corporations and opacity at state level. Feminists are describing the area of the text where the binding treaty is mentioning the systemic causes that have led the progress or advancement of economic power to create the architecture of impunity, what the global campaign says. As a feminist group, we organically started working three years ago. We believe, and I believe that the former speaker mentioned that there are three instances that we believe important. First and foremost, there should be uh, emphasis on determining the scope of the treaty and to underscore the role of multinational companies. Number two, privacy of human rights. That is to say, in a context where free trade and investment uh, treaties are uh, growing in the company and uh, the corporations are suing uh, some state nations, this binding treaty must be excluded from free treaty and trade agreements that could end up being used as a mechanism to discuss the binding treaty. We also believe that the new text has incorporated certain topics that, such as women advocates. It broadens the concept of victims. It now includes family members and persons related to the victims. We do believe that this text is more organized. It underscores victims and prevention. And we also know that it, it, it better expresses in Article 6 and 7, extraterritoriality. And we believe that it is a political attempt. The uh, political event uh, attempt is to make this instrument into something more robust. We don't want to end up with a clean language where we just reinforce the steering principles or the OCDE principles. But uh, the fifth consultation will take place in Ecuador, and that's where negotiations will take place. We are g going to uh, go to that meeting with novel ideas and believing that the role of the advocates should be perfectly described as well as access to justice, due diligence mechanisms, as well as gender impact should also be strongly declared. That is the key point of discussion with negotiators because the European Union is just going for the minimum. And the friends of the treaty who are Ecuador, Alba countries, a few European countries, a lot of African civil society groups are saying that negotiations with African countries are going strong. Next week, we know that we will have uh, the opportunity to dialogue with certain states, and we will uh, be able to shed light on the hotspots of the discussion and the process in October. We really wanted to become a space where feminists and women advocates and women involved in these negotiations may have an active engagement, active role. We are also concerned, just like the case of Sonora that I wanted to show you in the video, to, we need to define contractual relations because it's hard. Uh, the communities we, we work at and you, with the women and with a lot of the people who are in the informal economy, it's difficult to sh for them to show evidence of their contractual relationship. And we would like to establish 
the commercial relations so the whole process is alleviated because it's not only a claim for justice but it's also a claim for improved administrative mechanisms and people who are calling out corruption and they are placing and they're filing complaints of human rights violations we want to give them prevent protection and we should also talk about prevention there are a lot of cases and a lot of explanations of why the current situation, which is, is since it's, it's not non-binding yet, we know that impact assessments must be carried out by states. They should uh, have the civil society involvement, an open and informed process, consultation process. And we should also try to create and build the environment for political discussion. This is yet at a weak level in the document. And just to wrap, because I just have one minute, let me say that the document we drafted with the feminist group and the other document we're working on, economic and cor corporate capture, these are all documents that, of course, must be concluded now. We are in the final draft and if you're going to Geneva, as I am, or if you're in a different territory, there are other places to participate. And we can get in touch with our states. <coughs> we should send technical messages to the civil society. And finally, The binding treaty is yet another instrument. We started out with volunteers, with voluntary documents, and we now have this robust and ambitious instrument that we hope will be fulfilled. There's a lot to do, but human rights and corporations are not working properly together. We now have the opportunity. There are persons working in justice, access to reproductive rights, enforced disappearances, enforced displacement. And in addition to the binding treaty, we can create a common place of discussion a political discussion that may lead to other alternatives. So I want to invite you to think about the binding treaty not only as an instrument for people with a legal capacity to work in Geneva, but it's also a way in which, which we can all challenge the corporate space from our working sphere. The video is there, and the link to the video is in the chat, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Alejandra. I'm also going to continue in Spanish. Thank you very much, Alejandra, for your presentation. The political perspective you just provided us with is key so we can get involved in the process from the different perspectives in which we are all part of, and I am sure that the participants of this webinar will find this information extremely useful. There are many challenges still ahead, and we have to try to solve them. So this binding treaty will address effectively the needs of the communities that get the, the perceive the impact of major corporations. We will open up the floor uh, for questions for our deaf and speakers, Mawish and Sifa, Elizabeth and Alejandra are ready to address your questions. In the meantime, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Number one, ESCR is promoting the national campaign for women, the national strike of women and the purpose of that strike is that on March 8th of next year we should all make a strike and we have to let the world know that without women the world will stop without women the world will not be able to move forward and I would like to invite you all to take a look at the campaign so you can join the campaign 
We will invite you and we will have the further conversations around the campaign. I would also like to invite you uh, on Monday, uh, September 30, we will have a new webinar on corporate capture. It will be focused on community manipulation. It will be held by the Working Group on Corporate Transparency, and it's uh, tightly linked to the topics we've been dealing with, and I wanted to extend the invitation to you. I also wanted to let you know that we will receive applications so if you want to join a conversation on litigation. If you want, you can get in touch with Fernando. He is the leader of the strategic litigation group, or you can contact me as well. Our contact information will be on the screen, uh, on the chat. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can. Let's see if there are questions. Another question is if this uh, webinar's video will be disseminated. Yes, it will be available in four languages because we have simultaneous interpretation into English, Spanish, Arabic, and French and you will get the video. You can use it as a teaching tool within your organizations, without, within your movement, so you can discuss it in your own movements and have further conversations on these topics. Let's see, there's a question from Christine. She's asking, she says, as we know, that traditional knowledge is an important tool in environmental conservation and that it encourages the equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of genetic resources. The interaction between traditional knowledge and practice has been eroded by corporate captors by eviction of the communities, displacement of communities, and disconnection with their ancestral lands. Is there anybody who would like to talk about the interaction between traditional knowledge and practice and the treaty? Is there any speaker who would like to address this topic? It seems Alejandra has a comment. I'm going to give you the floor, Alejandra. I don't know if this question has a, a, a direct link to, to knowledge, but let me say that although the text has been drafted and reviewed, and of course we talked about the importance of indigenous communities, the importance of ancestral and traditional knowledge, as well as the principle in the indigenous people's declaration about free and informed consent. This is not reflected in the revised text. It is a gap. And I do believe that it has to do with the fact that the presence of indigenous communities in Geneva is not as strong because of costs and the difficulties of translating, you know, of translating the experience of one territory to a discussion led in Geneva. Although Ecuador, Bolivia, a few Asian countries did bring their communities and they tried to put the topic on the table, it, it was just brought up as a consultation, but not including consent. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge uh, so we can keep on setting pressure upon our states so they can acknowledge it. Because 
priority is given to knowledge, incorporating discussions about technology, AI, electronic platforms. So it seems it's one or the other, you know, or that the new way of thinking and conceiving the world is the only way to go. And there's strong contradiction and dissociation between knowledge and diversity. And I believe that it is one of our major challenges, you know, to build dialogue so we can be able to build a platform and a treaty that will truly address the situation in the territories without uh, leaving our communities and traditional knowledge behind. Patents is also a strong issue. Seeds, biodiversity, this is left out of the discussion in a raw way. Of course, at the United Nations level, it, these topics are dealt with. There is a conversation on biodiversity, but it doesn't have anything to do with what's happening in Geneva. And, you know, the discussions on the binding treaty should in Geneva should include this topic. Like, for instance, I'm wearing this uh, T-shirt, and it says, Patents kill. There's another group who's introducing the whole topic about drugs, generics, protection of seeds and biodiversity. We must all remember that this is an important topic, especially for companies who are even acquiring or purchasing traditional knowledge. So you might, I invite you to read the document so you can give us ideas on which human rights mechanisms can be used, what articles of which conventions or which covenants that can be used, because it's the only way we can show them, because the dialogue is now a more technical way, and we have to show them that this is all protected under the human rights mechanism, and we should all get politically activated in this topic. I fully agree. Thank you, Alejandra. Elizabeth would also like to answer those questions, so I'm going to give her the floor. Thank you very much, Viviana. I'd like to agree with what Alejandra has just said. Um, this is a matter that uh, has been very close to the hearts of indigenous people, but one that has not gotten uh, the clout or the following um, uh, in the negotiations. And um, it's really unfortunate because uh, our domestic laws um, are quite deficient, even in terms of dealing with tangible assets, particularly when you look at uh, compensation for communities uh, living in, uh, you know, uh, areas rich in natural resources such as minerals, oil and gas, etc. Even for tangible assets such as land, uh, physical structures such as houses and, and other structures, trees and crops, etc. Communities still have challenges about uh, ha having a proper legal framework that adequately compensates them for this. So for, for an intangible asset such as uh, traditional knowledge, it becomes even far much more difficult. So oftentimes we are finding that uh, communities and particularly indigenous peoples have no protections under domestic law for these kind of rights that they have uh, on their traditional knowledge. And, um, you know, the gains that they have had out of, uh, uh, you know, either being able to collect uh, or to enhance their economic well-being as a result of that uh, particular traditional knowledge. So, so it is uh, quite a shame that uh, this still is not a negotiate is, is not uh, an issue on the table. But um, probably it will be a good thing that uh, for you know organisations that are working with indigenous peoples to come out much more strongly on this particular matter. Gracias, Elizabeth. Bueno, parece que ya el tiempo. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I think we're running out of time. There's a question for Alejandra oh, or to share the following steps as uh, pertains to the treaty and if she can include or talk about timelines or where the current situation is. Can you tell us, Alejandra, before we wrap up? Okay. There you go. 
I apologize. I'm the big talker here. When it comes to the feminist group, let me tell you that we're about to finish the document. Uh, I think we, we will disseminate it next week. Mona or Viviana will send you the document so you can give us your recommendations. And the week prior, the weekend prior to the start of the negotiations, we will get together. So we will meet in Geneva. If, uh, on October 14, we will have a strategic meeting on October 11. The campaign to dismantle corporate power will meet up on October 12 with different actions held in and outside of Geneva with different protests and different people. And we will also have a panel in Geneva. We hope we can forward messages. We have our Facebook page and a hashtag, you know, Mona and Viviana can forward you this information. And in the strategic meeting, we also expect to create the steps after Geneva, you know, so we can all follow the discussion to include, so to find a way to challenge corporate power. The feminist group is an open group. If there are more groups who want to join us, of course, there is a minimum of principles, okay? You have to follow certain codes and you have to respect certain codes, but it's an open group. If you want to join, it's the feminist group for the binding treaty. Mona and Viviana can send you information about us as well. Thank you, Alejandra. Yes, indeed. We will share more information with you about this process. I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank today's speakers. I wanted to thank everybody who joined us, every uh, member of the network. I want to uh, thank the participants and the interpreters. And I also want to invite you to our next webinar on social protection systems, access to free information. We will have this webinar the last week of October, and we will send you further information the next weeks. Thank you very much, everybody, for your engagement. We'll be in touch.